going to the book of Haggai, and you say, what preacher? <laughs> it's not one I'm familiar with opening up to. Uh, that's where we're at tonight, the book of Haggai, and it's page 962 in my Bible. Uh, it's one of them short books again. It's... Uh, You'll find this prophet right before the prophet Zechariah. It's right after Zephaniah. So he's in between the Z's. And uh, we're at part nine. Nine books into the Old Testament. We're moving right along. Short book, two chapters. And uh, so he's a minor prophet. He was the prophet of the restored remnant after 70 years of captivity. And uh, as we'll see here in a minute, uh, the book of Ezra really references this book. And so we have to go to Ezra at some point here in a minute to see that. And uh, although I don't reference it, also Nehemiah references this short book. Stand with me, if you will, the reading of the word of God. Four verses for the text. And, uh, this book really just has one thought. Two chapters, we're going to dissect it. The prophet writes as the Lord, the Lord would come to Haggai the prophet. We're starting in verse 5, chapter 1, where he says, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. There it is again. He says in this last verse of the text, Go up to the mountain. Bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we honor this time, God, of your house, of this gathering of your people, and this reading of your word. It's holy, and it's to be honored, to be reverenced. We do so this evening. We take this time and we set it apart just for you, not for ourselves, but God, to hear from your word. So I ask you to speak to our hearts, change our lives, those here, those listening by internet. God would be transformed again by the renewing of our mind, so then we can prove what is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. We bless you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray, and the church said, Amen. Amen. The book of Haggai. We're searching again for Christ in this Old Testament book, and we see Jesus is revealed in Haggai as God's people are empowered to conquer a distraction and the discouragement that they're experiencing. The emphasis that we'll find here, not just in four verses, but in the book, but especially focusing in the first chapter, is a message towards getting priorities straight. Give a little historical background. I always like to do so just to build a foundation for where we're going. What's going on at this time in the Bible. Haggai here, he's coming near to the end of the Old Testament chronologically. God's people were becoming established in the earth at this time. And Solomon started the building of the temple in 586 B.C., but Babylonian forces came later and destroyed it. Seventy years later, we find King Cyrus allowing the Jews to start to build the second temple. Nehemiah then rebuilds the walls, even though he was met with great resistance. Now God's people had grown discouraged because of what was transpiring. And they had become weary with opposition to their call by the Lord to build the temple. I want us to look here, if we can, at the beginning 
of the chapter in verse 1, we can read together. The Bible says in the second year of Darius the king in the sixth month and the first day of the month came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest. So the word of the Lord had come. The prophecy of Haggai gives us several specific chronological marking points like we just saw in verse 1. You go to verse 15. The Bible says in the 4 and 20th day of the 6th month in the 2nd year of Darius the king. Uh, if you go to chapter the other chapter in this book, if you look at verse 1, verse 10, verse 20, there's several instances that the prophecy uh, is stated to have begun in the month of September uh, in 520 B.C. Uh, move along here in verse 2 of chapter 1. The Bible says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Verse 3, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? He gives this first word here. This is the time where exiles had been uh, back in Jerusalem for a long, around the time of about 18 years. But the work of rebuilding the temple had set idle for around 14 years. So they had been there about four years, maybe working on something, and then they completely stopped what they were doing for 14 years. But look with me again in verse 3. It says, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? So obviously there was a point in time when the work of building God's house was good. It started out good. We see evidence from where it started when we go to the book of Ezra, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago. In Ezra chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. And then when you go to verse 10, the Bible says, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel, which we'll find out about here in just a minute. Verse 11, and they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And then we get to Ezra chapter number 4 and look at verse 1. It says, now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of of the captivity built the temple unto the Lord God of Israel. Then they came to Zerubbabel, to the chief of the fathers, and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Asarhaddon, king of Assur, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, you have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And we go towards the end of the chapter 4, verse 24, it says this. Then seized the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it seized into the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. This is where we find ourselves now in Haggai chapter 1. And despite the glorious beginning of how things were going, after two years, the work stops and the people full of discouragement and then they were initially derailed probably by a lack of focus of what 
the task at hand was. And at this point in time, when Haggai prophesied, the foundation of the temple was laid and the altar was rebuilt, but the temple wasn't yet built for the Lord. And so in verse 2, the people respond to the former command to rebuild the temple. Where the Bible says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Now, the people did their best here, as we have read, to make their excuse on why not to obey God sound really spiritual. And, and, and they couldn't speak here against the idea of building the temple so they spoke against its timing and they say it isn't God's timing to rebuild the temple well who are we to say what God's timing is on anything God as we talked about the greatness of God or the great God this morning who is in charge of everything in the world it's his timing it's his plan and his purpose and it's not for us to step in and say God this God that this, that, or the other. But here's the problem. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, we hear the word that contradicts these people's excuse. This is actually was the beginning stages of everything that was to take place. We start in verse 1 of 1 Chronicles 28, and the Bible says, And David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, and the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course. And the captains over the thousands and captains over the hundreds and the stewards over all the substance and possession of the king and of his sons with the officers and with the mighty men and with all the valiant men unto Jerusalem. Then David the king stood up on his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in my heart to build a house of of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of God and had made ready for the building. Verse 3, But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. Howbeit the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler and the house of of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel, and of all my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons. He hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And he said unto me, Solomon, thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Verse 7. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. Now therefore, in the sight of all of Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance for your children after you forever. Verse 9, And thou, Solomon, my son, Know thou the God of my, thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. David already knew what hesitation could be like. David already knew what uh, excuses and negligence could be like. And so he's telling his son, don't fall under that umbrella. Don't, 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 don't live that way. Be about the Lord's business. Follow after him. Do his will. Could, uh, listen to his commands. Follow his ways and do it. Just don't hesitate. Do it. And so there's no excuse here. There, there's no delay necessary and the people here in Haggai begin to rationalize the task at hand. And, and they decided that it wasn't time to rebuild it after all. It's as if they were really saying, if it's so hard, evidently God doesn't want us to do it right now. At least not any time soon. I, I, I would say this. Sometimes God calls us to do things 
Not because he knows we can't do it. I think sometimes he just wants to know that we'll obey a command that he's always given. It, it may seem out of the ordinary. It may seem impossible. And many times it is impossible. But God's not going to ask us to do something if he's not going to give us the strength and the provision to get it done. Notice the words of the Lord, verse 2. He calls them something. Look at verse 2 of it again. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, Haggai 1, saying, This people say, This people, we, we may never like to hear God call us this people. It's really good to hear God call us when he says, My people. But he called them this people. And I believe he said this because he saw their excuses and and he saw their poor priorities and he noticed that they were not living like his people should be living. And so he says in verse 5 of our text, he says, Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He didn't say my ways. Don't consider everybody else around you's ways. But you consider your ways. And in my coming of age, we, we kind of said it like this. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. You really need to get your I's dotted and your T's crossed and, and your ducks in a row, some people might say. Uh, and, and if you get a chance, uh, and, 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 and I, 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 jokingly, I, I'll get royalties for this later, but uh, I, 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 I've been reading through Tyler's book, Considerations for the Christian Life. And if you get a chance, read the book. And But the, in chapter 9 of his book, at the beginning, he I love where he mentions something. He, he mentions his, he's talking about his childhood flaws and his childhood problems and, and, and how he, he said, I was a procrastinator. He said, I, I waited for the last minute to do things. Even in school, if I had a project or a paper, he said, I'd wait for the last minute to do things and then I'd rush through whatever it was to get it done on time. And, and he presents this definition of procrastinating. He, he called it putting off till tomorrow what could be done today. But in his case, he said, and, and he stated for his sake, it's what should have been done yesterday. And, and I began to think about what he was saying there. And, and it's interesting even too in his book, you know, considering, considering Things and, and I parallel just that thought there uh, of his life and what he was saying uh, with what God is declaring through the prophet here to a negligent people. They didn't have their priorities uh, in order. They were fully out of order. They were negligent. They were procrastinating. And then we look at verse 3 and he says, uh, in verse 4 it says, It's time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and, and, and your houses... Uh, the, God's house lies waste and he's telling them to consider their ways and, and the people are saying it's not time to rebuild the, the temple of the Lord it, but in their actions what they were really saying it was time to live in their nicely built houses basically their heart was far from God but with their lips they honored him the Bible tells us he says you honor me with your lips but your heart is far from me that was the difference between Solomon in 1 Chronicles 28 and the people here in Haggai chapter number 1. Solomon first built a house for God and then for himself. But with the people, it was vice versa. Their heart was flip-flop, you might say. This was the real problem, not that God's people lived in uh, these sealed houses. God doesn't have a problem with you living in a nice house house, but that they lived in such a personal comfort and luxury while God's priority sat on the back shelf. Doing what God wanted you to do was second to what you wanted to do, you could say. But the problem was simply wrongly ordered priorities. They weren't content to let the cause of the Lord's uh, uh, to, to obey the cause of the Lord, but they, they rather let the cause of the Lord suffer so they could be comfortable. They should have been as willing to sacrifice for the work of God as they were for their personal desires. The excuses are so familiar. God saw through them in the days of Haggai, and he sees through those excuses even in 2024. 20, 
Prophet Haggai was like an alarm clock. You know what an alarm clock's like at 4 a.m.? It's unwelcome, but it's absolutely necessary. You got to get up. You got to go do your task. You got to have your day and get done what needs to be done. And, and, and so this is the excuse of our lives. They, they seem to sometimes get in the way of God's will for our lives. And so absolutely, like Haggai spoke uh, to the people, it should cause us to consider our ways. I love what G. Campbell Morgan said. He said, the one all-inclusive reason for the neglect of the things of God is the departure of the heart from him. It was about building a physical temple, yes, in the Old Testament. But in our day, it seems like people say, well, brother, I'm just waiting on God, and then I'll go do it whenever. What that really means is I really don't have a desire to do it, but it makes me sound like I'm obedient. We'll use verses like the ever so popular Romans 8, 28, and even misquote it just to suit our situation. Well, all things are going to work together for my good, so I'm just going to sit here and wait until. It's really just a cop-out, just to be honest with you. Because if you read the original translation, that verse actually tells us that God is working on our behalf in all things as a plan for good for those who love him, those that are calling uh, called according to his plan and purpose. And so what that tells us is that sometimes God is just waiting to see if we'll actually do what his word says. And while we're obeying, everything works for our good. We can't just sit on the sideline and say, well, God, when you speak, I'll get up. And God, when you this and God, when you that. Sometimes God is saying, when you this and when you that, then I'll do my part. So we must count the cost of obeying the Lord. Yeah, it costs us something to do. It costs us something to speak. It costs us something to go. It costs us something to give. We must count the cost for obeying the Lord. And many of people, when, when they begin to count the cost, they think it costs too much to serve the Lord. But when you look at the price of what Christ paid on Calvary, and all God did for us through his son, I believe we got the better end of the deal. When we came to Jesus, we got exceeding abundantly. <laughs> Above all, we could have ever asked for or thought up or conjured up or wrote down on a piece of paper. God didn't hold anything back from us when he sent Jesus to do his will. So why on earth do we hold anything back from him? All God was asking from the people through Haggai was consider your ways. Did you know that the Hebrew figure of speech called consider your ways in the English actually literally says as a phrase put your heart on the road. So Haggai was actually asking God's people to consider what direction your lives were heading in if you really wanted to continue in the way that you're going. He said, you so much and you bring in little. They were having some financial difficulties here. And it was all due to their wrong priorities. I can promise you, if you'll take care of what God asks, God will always take care of what you need. <laughs> they suffered setback after setback after setback because the blessing of God wasn't on their pocketbook. He says in verse 6, he says, You drink, but you're not filled with drink. Meaning, if your priorities are not right, Nothing's going to satisfy you. I want you to hear me today, and I'm actually getting ready to close. Every effort that we make in the wrong direction 
leads to nowhere. And it's going to reveal that there must be something more. There's something else that's actually going to satisfy. And nothing fills the God-shaped void in our lives except putting him first. And so through the prophet here in verse 7, God calls them one more time. He says in verse 7, consider your ways. I mentioned their neglecting earlier, and I referenced the word procrastinating or procrastination. So what he's really saying here in these four verses is consider what you're neglecting. And I would ask us tonight, what is that for you? What has God called you to do that you're neglecting? What is it that the Lord, you know, he put on your heart, he gave you in your life? It may be salvation for somebody listening. It may be that he's, his spirit has tugged and tugged and tugged and tugged at your heart. Oh, I'll get saved when, I, when it's the right time. Oh, when it's convenient, I'll give my heart to the Lord. Or maybe it's not that. Maybe it's a, a ministry call. Maybe it's what's just anything that God has laid on your heart to do. And you've said, maybe when I get a chance. I love what Dr. Billy Graham said. He says, many people argue. He said, I do believe in Christ. I believe in the church and I believe in the Bible. Isn't that enough? He says, no, you must receive Christ. He said, I may go to the airport. I have a reservation. I have a ticket in my pocket. The plane is on the ramp. It's a big, powerful plane. And I am certain that it will take me to my destination. They call the flight three times and I neglect to get on board. They close the door. The plane taxis down the runway and takes off, and I am not on the plane. Why? I believed in the plane, but I neglected to get on board. That's just it. He said, you believe in God, Christ, the Bible, and the, the church, but you have neglected to actually receive him in your heart. Your belief has been an impersonal, speculative thing, and you have not entrusted yourself to him. Well, preacher, I like the sermon. I just don't care for who spoke it. Sad as that statement is, we preach Jesus. And that reality is no different than saying this. Oh, I love the peace of rest in the green pastures. And I love the cool of the still waters. Just not much on the ship. I'm going to close with this. There was an incident recorded from the American Revolution. And it illustrates what tragedy can result from procrastination. It's reported that Colonel Rawl, the commander of the British troops in Trent, New Jersey, was playing cards when a Courier brought an urgent message stating that General George Washington was crossing the Delaware River. Raw put the letter in his pocket and didn't bother to read it until the game was finished. Then realizing the seriousness of the situation, he hurriedly tried to rally his men to meet the coming attack, but his procrastination was his undoing. He and many of his men were killed and the rest of the regiment were captured. Norbert Quell said, only a few minutes delay cost him his life, his honor, and the liberty of his soldiers. Earth's history is strewn with the wrecks of half-finished plans and unexecuted resolutions. Tomorrow is the excuse, the lazy, and the refuge of the incompetent. See, folks, the tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon but that we wait so long to begin it there'll be many procrastinators in hell one day because like Colonel Rawl because neglect will be your undoing because it wasn't decades or years or months or even days but it was only a few minutes delay that cost him his life 
Many people have said, oh, I've got plenty of time. And they're convinced by that lie and that maybe in their last breathing moments before death, they'll make things right. I've said it, the deathbed of men that just barely made the right decision, couldn't communicate, couldn't open their eyes, couldn't look at me, and just only by the squeeze of a hand did I know they heard what I had to say. I thank God for that time and that moment where as sad as it was, the whole life was spent living for the world and for the devil, and yet in the last breathing moments, yet they did commit their life to the Lord, and I thank God for that, and heaven rejoiced with me that day, but yet, why live a life like that and play games with eternity? Because the Bible says, it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. You know what that tells me, brother, sister, who are listening? Death doesn't have a warning. It's your life. And is it worth playing the wrong card? Because you're either all in or you're not. That's all God will accept. He doesn't want just a little bit. He wants everything. I'm I'm reminded as we get ready to pray of Jesus and he's coming into the room with his disciples and he's teaching them about servanthood and how no servant's greater than his master. And the Bible says that Jesus took a towel and threw it over his arm and he brought the basin of water in and he comes to Peter and he's wanting to wash Peter's feet and he says, oh Lord, you can never wash my feet. He said, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. And so here was Peter's response in that moment of humility. Then, Lord, wash not only my feet, but my head and my hands. I'm telling you, some of us need to get a not only but also in us. God, I don't want you to take care of just this, not only this, but also I want you to take care of this. I want to give you everything. Everything, not just a little part. All is what God will receive. That's all he'll take. And just like the children here in Haggai 1, who started out good, obeying the Lord, but they let a disappointment or a, a, a discouragement get in their way, and it detoured them, and they really no longer put God's priorities on the shelf, but yet their priorities and their comfort on the shelf and put God's on the back burner. I'm going to tell you something right now. The minute you put God on the back burner and you forget him, you're going down the wrong road. You better get your priorities straight. Jesus is coming soon. And we don't know when. And there's no time for a back burner. I heard an old preacher say one time like this, and then we're going to pray he said, your back will burn one way or the other. You'll either put Christ on the back burner and then eventually pick him back up in time, or you'll leave him on the back burner, and then your back will burn. Now, I know that's a lot to take in, but it's the truth. There's grace for you today. There's forgiveness for you today. If you'll accept Christ, confess your sins, he'll save you. He will. He'll do it right now. Can we bow our heads tonight? I'm done. Let us pray together if we can. If there's anybody here in the house, trust me, everybody's right with God, but we just want to always take a moment. If anybody needs to talk to the Lord, the altar's open. You can come tonight. Find help. Heavenly Father.